uh, sort of as a, uh, a review of the, the antediluvian period of, uh, of the Athenaeum. Uh, there are, are there are institutions. Um, there are a few institutions that are so strongly identified uh, with their uh, with their building, uh, and I thought it would be a good idea to uh, to examine uh, some of those uh, some of those early years before this uh, this building uh, was built. Um, Describing the Athenaeum can be uh, can be difficult uh, to say the least, particularly to those who are not um, who are not familiar with the institution. I won't even say to those who are not Philadelphians. Um, but uh, I'll give you my uh, my uh, take on this after 37 years of of, of having to uh, uh, describe what it is we're about. <clears throat> um, there, if we go to the, the definition, um, an Athenaeum was named for Athena or Pallas and Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom uh, and war. Uh, and uh, in a dictionary uh, uh, definition is an association of persons interested in scientific or literary pursuits. Uh, two, a library or reading room. Three, a sanctuary of Athena at Athens, built by the Roman Emperor Hadrian, and frequented by poets and men of learning. Uh, and four, a Philadelphia Literary Society founded in 1814 to collect materials connected with the history and antiquities of America and the useful arts, and generally to disseminate useful knowledge. And four, B, the building housing the Athenaeum uh, of Philadelphia designed by John Notman. Uh, it's a great uh, little nutshell to, to, to have. So the Athenaeum is three things. Think of it, uh, I guess you can call us Trinitarians. We are a subscription library uh, uh, and we are one of 16 surviving uh, subscription libraries uh, in the United States. Uh, and uh, yes, that is my library card and no, the full barcode is not there. So please don't try to uh, get that to borrow books on my account. And there are some of the uh, books that are available to you today. Uh, the Athenaeum is a National Historic Landmark. That's the 4B. Uh, and uh, as many uh, of you know, uh, within Philadelphia County, there's more than 11,000 buildings on the National Register of Historic Places, but there are fewer than 65 that are National Historic Landmarks. Uh, and so in 1977, the Secretary of Interior decided that the Athenaeum was uh, um, part of that creme de la creme uh, of the uh, National Register buildings within uh, Philadelphia County. And thirdly, uh, the Athenaeum is an independent research library with internationally recognized historic collections documenting architecture, design history, uh, and the built uh, environment. So three, uh, a three-legged stool, a trinity, if you will. Now to before 2, uh, 219, the period from 1814 to 1847. Uh, I wanted to give a shout out to Roger Moss and his book, Philadelphia Victorian, which was published uh, now 22 years ago. Uh, I wouldn't want to give the impression that I had thoroughly researched everything that you're going to see today, uh, but he, uh, uh, he wrote this wonderful book in, um, uh, in coordination with the 150th anniversary of, uh, of our building. Uh, and uh, that book is available here for, uh, both for purchase as well as for borrowing. Uh, and then a second volume, uh, certainly less well known, uh, is a master's thesis that was written by a former Athenaeum employee whose name is Jill Meisner. Uh, and it's from 1986 and it's called In Pursuit of Culture. Uh, and she did a st statistical examination of the uh, charter members of the Athenaeum from, uh, from 1815 uh, and what their, their background was. Uh, and that's also available here uh, for you to, uh, to either borrow or peruse. So thanks, uh, thanks to both Roger and Jill uh, for their hard work on this. Uh, so let's uh, look at uh, the, the Philadelphia at the time of the founding of the Athenaeum. Uh, and we can actually look at it through the words of uh, our first vice president, uh, an interesting fellow by the name of James, uh, James Mays. This is from a portrait that was given to us uh, in the year 2018 uh, by the Pennsylvania Society for the Promotion of Agriculture. Uh, Mays was an interesting fellow. Uh, he was a doctor by trade. He was an early advocate of aspirin as a pain reliever. Uh, he was also, uh, um, uh, he 
tinkered with a, an invention of ketchup. Uh, he was the American who decided that ketchup should be tomato based. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a, an interesting uh, tidbit. Uh, but his family relations uh, and his cultural relations were um, extensive. He was the son-in-law of Pierce Butler, signer of the Declaration of Independence from South Carolina. Uh, he was the um, father of uh, Pierce Butler, uh, who um, married and uh, married uh, the famous British actress Fanny Kemble, uh, and uh, that's a story for a whole other a whole other time. But he was very uh, uh, very interesting fellow, and the first uh, first Athenian vice president. And right before we opened in 1811, he wrote the first uh, essential, essential guidebook to the city, a 320 page volume called A Picture of Philadelphia, which actually met, went through several editions uh, in, the, in the first quarter of the 19th century. Uh, and we have, uh, this was one of the first volumes uh, in the Athenaeum collection when we, uh, uh, when we started out. So what was it that, uh, that um, um, James Meese said about Philadelphia. Um, city, uh, quote, the city is lighted by 1,132 lamps enclosed in glass lanterns, most of them lighted only on those nights when the moon does not give sufficient light. The improved parts are paved with round stones brought from the bed of the Delaware at Trenton Falls. And the degree of uniformity of the brick houses has always appeared a striking defect to intelligent strangers. Mies proudly boasted that his city had three libraries, four banks, six schools, eight daily newspapers, 11 insurance companies, 13 charitable institutions, 43 places of religious worship, 51 printers, and 102 hatters. Uh, and uh, by the way, we had 3,648 spinning wheels. Uh, so he got down into the minutia uh, of the city, but also uh, 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 lavishly illustrated uh, his, uh, his volume. So in 1814, uh, what was the city like? Well, of course, the city itself only went from river to river uh, and from, uh, from Vine Street to south. Uh, and the city was still very, very much centered around uh, Independence Square. Uh, in essence, uh, Independence Square was the, the town square uh, of Philadelphia, certainly until, uh, until 1871. This is an unfinished um, uh, uh, strike of a uh, print that was done by Alexander Lawson after John Lewis Crimble's famous painting, Election Day at the State House in 1815. And it shows sort of the uh, jocular and somewhat drunken activities that were going on. Uh, in those days, all Philadelphians were required to, to bring their vote by hand and hand it through the open window of Congress Hall uh, to, the, uh, to the election uh, uh, workers uh, to, to be counted. Uh, we see here the Independence Hall or the State House as it was still then known uh, before it had gotten its William Strickland Tower. This little uh, black bar here indicates what was going on on the second floor of the State House then, uh, and that was uh, Charles Wilson Peale's museum in the long room of the State House. On the other side of the State House, you had a uh, philosophical hall. Uh, through this view uh, from 1800 uh, by Thomas and William Birch. Uh, across, uh, directly across the Fifth Street from Philosophical Hall was the Library Hall, the home of the Library Company of Philadelphia, uh, and the Surgeons Hall, uh, a little bit further down on Fifth Street. And so the establishment of the Athenaeum in, in the early 19th century is, it, one way to look at it is a continuing step uh, or a step in the continuing democratization of knowledge uh, in, in Philadelphia and indeed in America. Uh, and so looking at a chronology here of, of, of the libraries and, and the learned societies in the city, 1731, the granddaddy of them all, founded by Ben Franklin, the library company. 1742, the Friends Library, which was located in the Friends Meeting House. Uh, the American Philosophical F Society, also founded by Franklin uh, in, um, in 1743. The Library at the University of Pennsylvania, also founded by Franklin uh, in 1749. 
the Loganian Library uh, was organized in 1759 at the death of James Logan, William Penn's uh, uh, secretary um, uh, here in Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania Hospital had its own library, as did the College of Physicians. In 1812, the Academy of Natural Sciences was founded. They had their own library, uh, and it's on their heels that the Athenaeum arrived in 1814. That certainly was not the end uh, of uh, the, the library age in Philadelphia. Uh, right on our heels were the Apprentices Library, which was located in the Friends, the Free Friends uh, Meeting House uh, at the corner of Fifth and Art Street, uh, and um, the Mercantile Library uh, on Fifth Street uh, in 1821, and then in 1824 the twin institutions of HSP and the Franklin Institute, both of which had substantial libraries of their own, were founded. So uh, that's that's where we fall sort of in the uh, uh, in the canon of Philadelphia libraries. And so where were we? If you look at this uh, view uh, from uh, 1851 from uh, the uh, Julio Reyes uh, panoramic business directory of Chestnut Street, you can actually see two of uh, our first homes. Uh, the first one was at the corner of 4th and Chestnut Street. Uh, we rented two rooms on the second floor of Anthony Finley's uh, bookshop. Uh, and um, uh, we moved in uh, less than uh, three weeks, uh, uh, three months after uh, the original sort of founding meeting uh, of the of the Athenaeum, which had occurred in uh, in 1813. So by March of 1814, we were on the second floor uh, of that uh, of that room. We we stayed in that building uh, for three years, and then uh, the building had been purchased by uh, publisher Matthew Carey. Uh, and Carrie, who would become a longtime subscriber and supporter of the Athenaeum, uh, gave us our walking papers, uh, and he needed this space on the second floor for his successful business. And so for a period of six months, we moved down uh, down the block on Chestnut Street uh, on the 300, or what would become the 300 block, to the Universal Bookstore. So we were on the second floor of the Universal Bookstore, uh, which was then run by a fellow by the name of Nicholas Dufif. Uh, and the detail, uh, the detail of the images uh, below shows that the, the bookstore here was on the corner of Carpenter's Court and Chestnut Street. And if you look in the distance there, you can see Carpenter's Hall tucked behind the, uh, the, the 19th century uh, commercial structures. So we were on, uh, on the main drag, if you will, uh, for the first few years of our existence. In 1815, the, the uh, uh, state of Pennsylvania uh, issued a charter to the Athenaeum. Uh, and in a, um, a very handsome case, which we have here, um, there's four pages of, uh, of uh, vellum documents uh, that have our charter. And among the um, specific corporate purposes uh, in the Articles of Association, the Athenaeum was to, quote, collect materials relative to the history and antiquities of America and the useful arts and generally disseminate useful knowledge. It's a very, very broad, uh, very, very broad corporate purpose. Uh, the charter was signed by 139 uh, shareholder, uh, shareholders and then also uh, by 12, uh, 12 of our uh, directors. Now, who were these? Who were these original charter members? Well, first of all, they were all men. The Athenaeum wouldn't have any female uh, female members until uh, actually the first first one did not arrive until 1855. Uh, so, who, who were these? Uh, who were these men? Well, they they were merchants of the 139. 46 of them were merchants. 44 of them were lawyers. So those two categories alone um, accounted for uh, two thirds of, uh, of, the, of the membership. Uh, third, uh, the next largest category was unknown, uh, an unknown um, uh, profession. Oops. And uh, then you had gentlemen. Uh, and uh, in the 19th century, the term gentleman meant uh, not necessarily somebody who was idle, but the, somebody who did not have to work in order to, uh, to earn, earn a living or to, to, to um, um, somebody who, who, who had enough money that they didn't have to work, but quite often they did. Uh, then the next category are booksellers, editors, publishers, uh, uh, and, and uh, et cetera. And so that was a major force in Philadelphia um, uh, industry at the time. And it made sense uh, that uh, these folks uh, would be interested in, uh, in membership in the Athenaeum. 
if you see down there uh, in the twos and ones, uh, there's a variety of, of, uh, of professions. Uh, the most interesting one is penologist. Uh, and uh, that was how, uh, 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 I beg your pardon? That was how uh, that was how one of uh, one of our uh, charter members uh, designated himself in the city directories, and his name was Robert uh, Robert Svox, who was an early advocate of uh, of uh, humane treatment of prisoners. So the uh, Athenaeum charter members by institutional affiliation, 72 of our uh, charter members were, um, were already members of the library company uh, and 23 of them were members of the American Philosophical Society. So I don't want you to get the idea that these people gave up their shares uh, in these two organizations uh, and uh, came over to the Athenaeum. Um, much more likely is that they just added the Athenaeum to a number of, of many, many different institutions that they belong to. And it was not uncommon for, uh, for our members uh, to not only have memberships in a half a dozen or more um, cultural societies, but also to have leadership roles uh, in those. And we'll talk th about those a little bit more. So, so what made the Athenaeum attractive? Well, they, were, they wanted to have a convenient reading room and a place of common resort. Uh, and uh, our biggest or our closest, well, not competition, uh, was the library company. Uh, and so uh, there's a quote um, from, the, uh, from the early minutes of the Athenaeum uh, that said, while the city library, which is what the library company was known as, enables the public to procure books at a small expense for a perusal at home, the Athenaeum furnishes a place of useful an agreeable resort where valuable books may always be found and consulted. So the, uh, the and, and then below that, the Athenaeum uh, reading room hours in those early days, from April to September, we were open from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Uh, and uh, in the darker months, uh, October to March, we were open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Again, Monday through Saturday. Now, the library company had no reading room at all. If you wanted to borrow a book from the library company and you were a member, that was fine. You could go tell the librarian what you tell wanted, uh, and then he would uh, he would hand uh, he would hand the book to you, uh, and then you you left uh, and you took it home and read it. Uh, the Athenaeum provided a space for you to uh, to read it. And in fact, uh, in the first in the early years, uh, we did not uh, we did not loan books. Uh, everything that people wanted to read, they had to read at the Athenaeum. And look at the uh, at the hours of the library company. They were open from two o'clock until sunset. Uh, so they had much more abbreviated hours, uh, even though they had a great location and a great building, um, the, the Athenaeum provided a place to stop in before work, after work, during work, uh, because so many of the people uh, lived and worked in the immediate area around uh, Independence Square. Oops. So <clears throat> our third home was uh, Philosophical Hall. Uh, we moved in there in late 1817, and that would be uh, our home until uh, this building was completed in 18, uh, 1847. Uh, and in this view from the State House steeple, a uh, uh, lithograph that was done by J.C. Wilde in, 18, uh, in 1838, uh, you see the Philosophical Hall uh, in, in the foreground, immediately to its left is uh, City Hall. Uh, you can see the roof of the, the long gallery that, uh, that uh, uh, Charles Wilson Peel had occupied. And directly across the street is the library company. And then down the street is the west flank of the Second Bank of the United States. So in Philosophical Hall from 1817 to 47, uh, at first we rented the north, or actually sublet the north side of the first floor from the artist Thomas Sully. Uh, and our room there actually had a pretty good pedigree because that room had actually been uh, uh, the home to Charles Wilson Peel's museum. Uh, in 1812, uh, Peel moved to the second floor of uh, the State House, and Thomas Sully uh, rented out that space on the first floor on the north side. So initially, we sublet that space from him. Uh, but in about three years, uh, we actually uh, uh, outgrew that space and uh, occupied the entire first floor. There were three separate 
separate areas that the Athenaeum had in Philosophical Hall. One was a newspaper room, uh, one was a chess room, uh, and the other was called a conversation room. And so what sort of collections did we have at that time? Well, we had newspapers, uh, we had maps and charts, we had um, uh, encyclopedias, periodicals, and books. The subject areas were history, law, religion, politics. Novels were discouraged, uh, but tolerated. They tended to sneak into the catalog. And so here you have a silhouette uh, from those early days of uh, our librarian on the right, uh, William McElhenney playing chess uh, at one of the tables in Philosophical Hall. The Athenaeum, uh, while you had to be a subscriber or a shareholder to, uh, to use the rooms, if you were a stranger, that was if you were the captain of a ship or a visiting clergyman or a visiting diplomat, uh, you had access to, uh, to the, the reading rooms. Uh, and we have a record of strangers from 1814 when we first opened through the 18, uh, 1890s where people signed in. Uh, and in November of 1838, Mr. Edgar Allan Poe uh, actually visited our rooms uh, in Philosophical Hall, uh, and he he signed the uh, he signed the register. Uh, other famous visitors uh, to the Athenaeum were, of course, uh, Joseph Bonaparte uh, uh, and. Um, uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, who in 1825 visited Philadelphia, and he oh, he is the sole owner of the honor that um, uh, that uh, he's the only honorary member uh, ever elected to to the Athenaeum. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the presidents of the Athenaeum. Uh, the first one was William Tillman, who uh, at the time was also the, uh, the, uh, the head of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. He was the chief justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Uh, this is a portrait by Rembrandt Peel. Um, for a part of the time that he was president of the Athenaeum, he was also president of the Philosophical Society. So again, uh, it sort of shows that uh, interlocking uh, directorates that, uh, that, that were common in the the 19th century. Uh, Tillman uh, was originally from Maryland. Uh, his family owned extensive plantations in Maryland uh, where there were in, enslaved Africans. Uh, and uh, beginning in 1811, he began to manumit uh, many of his slaves. Uh, and that was primarily because so many of the court cases that were coming before him as Supreme Court justice had to do with the gradual abolition act of the Pennsylvania uh, state legislature. Uh, and uh, uh, he, uh, he he began to uh, uh, divest himself of, a, of his human uh, property uh, beginning in 1811 because of questions uh, about that. Generally, he ruled uh, for property rights as opposed to, uh, to human rights in those early cases. The second uh, president at the Athenaeum was uh, Peter Duponceau, who arrived at the age of 17, like Ben Franklin. Um, uh, in America. He came over on the same ship as, uh, uh, as Baron von Steuben, uh, and uh, he made a bet with the Baron uh, while on ship that, uh, that uh, he, could, he would kiss the first American woman he saw uh, and get away with it, and apparently, uh, and apparently von Steuben uh, lost that bet. Um, um, Peter Duponceau, like his predecessor, was also president of the American Philosophical Society while being president of the Athenaeum. Uh, and it was uh, Mr. Duponceau who, um, who actually uh, designed the, the seal of the Athenaeum. And then our third president uh, during this time period was Samuel Breck, uh, who, uh, who came to Philadelphia from Boston uh, around the time of the revolution uh, and uh, donated a, a very large collection of his own, uh, own library to, uh, to the Athenaeum. Uh, and it was uh, Samuel Breck who actually laid the cornerstone of the Athenaeum building on Washington Square. Uh, while these fellows were presidents, uh, we had uh, William McElhenney, who served as librarian of the Athenaeum. Uh, that was essentially the sole staff person uh, for that time, um, uh, from 1823 to 1854. Uh, he had the dual um, um, jobs uh, of also being the janitor uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the Philosophical Hall. Uh, so he was responsible for taking the coal in and out and for cleaning things up. Uh, as well as for uh, ordering books and uh, taking care of the, the materials in, in the reading room. Some early members of the Athenaeum included Roberts Vaux, uh, Nicholas Biddle, uh, Matthew Carey, uh, and then uh, William Strickland, who uh, was the first architect to join in, 18, uh, in 1820. 
Uh, the, um, the one of our members who I didn't have a portrait of is uh, William Lehman Jr., uh, who was a pharmacist from uh, Germantown, a, a medical doctor, but also a pharmacist and also a state legislator. Uh, and um, apparently he was a voracious reader, but uh, not only a reader, but that uh, he would uh, he would copy things and create marginalia for uh, for the books that he wrote. Uh, his uh, his uh, motto was studium sine colomo somnum, which uh, translated is if you read without a pencil in your hand, you might as well be sound asleep. Uh, and so fortune uh, uh, the uh, Legend has it that when he died, he left uh, between five and 6,000 copy books of his manuscript notes of the books that he had read. They did not come to the Athenaeum, or if they did, they didn't, uh, they didn't survive. But more importantly than those copy books that he left behind, when he died in 1829, he left a bequest to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia of $10,000 toward the construction of an edifice of chaste and simple architecture. And so um, you can't get much uh, simpler than the Walnut Street prison, but uh, this is just a segue. The prison uh, faced Independent Square at the corner of Sixth and Walnut from 1735 to 1830, uh, 1835. And when that was demolished, it opened up some prime real estate on Philadelphia's Central Square. This is the south view of that wild view uh, from around 1838. So you can see there was lots of prime real estate uh, that was open that went all the way down to, uh, to Locust Street street from Walnut. And so in those early days, there was an ambitious plan uh, in 1835 and 1836 to, uh, to build what was called a joint library. Uh, and it would have been directly opposite Independence Square on the site of the prison. Here are two drawings uh, that we have in the collection of four by Thomas Somerville Stewart. And within this three-story Egyptian revival building, there would have been the Athenaeum, the Academy of Natural Sciences, the Library Company, the Mercantile Library, the Law Academy Library, and the Foreign Language Library. Um, essentially, this would have been um, a Smithsonian institution right on, uh, right on Independence Square. There were at least two designs done for this building, one by uh, Stewart and the other one by his, uh, uh, by his master, um, uh, William Strickland. Uh, Strickland's uh, uh, designs for this survive at the Tennessee State Capitol. Uh, here you have a, a, a plan of the building, which was 300 feet long. You can see that it had, uh, it had uh, both uh, um, uh, external porticos as well as research, recess porticos on, on three sides of the building. And then immediately behind the building was a glass covered conservatory. And uh, as you go through, each, in, each of these institutions would have had their own separate libraries and reading rooms. Uh, that ambitious plan, even if it had gotten off the ground, um, uh, probably would not have worked. So by, the, uh, by 1840, uh, the, uh, the Athenaeum and the Library Company uh, started to talk about the idea of building a joint building, again, each with their own reading rooms. They hired John Notman to come up with this plan. Uh, uh, which is in our, uh, our collection here. And again, that fell by the wayside. Uh, apparently one of the problems uh, with the Athenaeum associating with the library company uh, was that the, the library company allowed uh, their women members, of which the Athenaeum had none at that time, they, they not only allowed women members, but they allowed their women members to go into the stacks unattended. Uh, and the Athenaeum minutes uh, indicate that uh, uh, that uh, our directors were having none of that because they needed to protect the uh, uh, the reputation of, uh, of 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 the ladies. So uh, in 1839, uh, the Athenaeum began to think about building a building of its own again, and they announced a competition. Uh, this is the first architectural uh, drawing that we uh, we actually added to the collection. It's a plan by William Strickland for the uh, the corner of Sixth Sixth uh, and Walnut Street just for the Athenaeum. Uh, also uh, submitting in that competition was John Haviland, same site, Thomas Eustick Walter, Napoleon Lebrun, 
and uh, John Notman from 1840. Uh, so the, the, be the best guns uh, of Philadelphia architecture uh, came forward to uh, play in a new building, a new sole building for the Athenaeum, uh, but um, the Athenaeum directors were hesitant. And the reason they were was because of the, the bank war between uh, Andy Jackson and uh, Athenaeum shareholder, um, Nicholas Biddle. Uh, even though uh, uh, Jackson uh, struck the dagger into the bank in uh, 1833, uh, the bank itself bled for a long, long time, uh, as did Philadelphia's finances, uh, and uh, the bank would not die uh, ultimately until 1841, uh, but not without creating a national and a local financial depression. Uh, not a good time to start building new, uh, new buildings. Uh, and of course, there's Andy Jackson ordering the withdrawal of federal funds, demolishing uh, the, the Second Bank of the United States. Uh, and there is Nicholas Biddle portrayed as Satan, complete with tail and horns. Uh, and of course, he is, he is identified as Old Nick, which was another name for, uh, uh, for uh, Satan. Uh, also, uh, during this time, because Biddle and the bank was so identified with uh, pure Greek revival architecture, um, uh, the Greek revival became identified with the Whig uh, party uh, and the Roman with uh, the uh, uh, Democratic party. And so uh, the stranglehold that the Greek revival had on, on uh, uh, buildings, particularly in Philadelphia, began to demolish with the, the fortunes of the bank. So before 19... 219, um, in many cases, is still at 219. So the next time you visit uh, the Athenaeum, uh, take a look around. Uh, accession number one uh, is this tall case clock uh, by James Lane. Uh, still works, still keeps pretty good time. It's in the reading room directly opposite uh, Jill's desk. Uh, and that uh, that was actually purchased uh, for the rooms in uh, in that building at 4th and Chestnut. So it, it was in all of our uh, all of our buildings. Uh, the hexagonal tables that the uh, that the uh, the new books are on uh, in our members' reading room, uh, those came to us uh, uh, from our rooms at Philosophical Hall. As did uh, a series of the uh, the Windsor chairs, which you'll see around the building. Uh, there are about twelve of these, but uh, they are scattered around the building right now. Some are in storage, some are out. And uh, there were a number of portrait busts. Uh, Minerva was one of four uh, plaster cast busts that was purchased in, uh, in 1814. Uh, and then of course, there are the drawings themselves from those early, uh, early competitions uh, here at the Athenaeum. And so uh, how we got from all of these designs to this design is the subject for uh, my next talk, uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. So at this point, I'd uh, love to hear if anybody has any questions uh, of Bruce. Um, we had one question about what happened to the, the collections of the Loganian Library and the Mercantile, uh, the Apprentices Library, after they closed, and Marianne Eve so Kindly noted that the first Loganian Library, um, its books were transferred to the library company. But do you know about the Prentice Library or the Mercantile Library? Well, the Mercantile Library had a number of homes uh, after it, it was built. Uh, it had a Greek Revival building on the east side of, uh, of Independence Square, just down the block from the library company. Uh, and uh, they were there until the 1870s. Uh, when they moved into a building at 10th and uh, uh, between Te Chestnut and Market. Uh, and uh, it was actually uh, actually uh, a Frank Furness design, a very early Frank Furness design. That uh, I'll, I'll ask Jeff Cohen, uh, it, my guess is that that's probably around 1870, 71, if Mike Lewis isn't here. Thank you. He's, Jeff is nodding, so thank uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, and then uh, and then that building was replaced by the uh, it, uh, the Mercantile Library merged as a branch of the Free Library of Philadelphia, uh, and they were in a, a wonderful, uh, sweet uh, modernist structure uh, on the 
the, the 10 hundred block of Chestnut Street, uh, this is by Martin Stewart and Noble, uh, which has uh, has met a rather sad fate. Um, uh, they they put up a, a, a sort of photo mural uh, based on uh, what it had looked like in in the uh, in, in the wall, which is pretty much. Um, which was a glass wall to begin with, but is uh, it was a very important building that sadly met it's uh, uh, a uh, not a very happy fate. Thank you. Are there more questions from folk? Bruce, did you? Uh, this is Paul Steinke. Hi, Paul. You left out. You left a great talk. Um, loved all the images of the competition drawings. Um, I guess two questions. One, just to follow up on the Apprentices Library, any idea what happened to that? And two, of the uh, other competition drawings that were submitted, is there one that maybe you wish had been chosen instead of Notman's? Well, I, I've, I've always been impressed by uh, Strickland's Egyptian Revival Building and just by the uh, uh, by the courage uh, or insanity uh, that those six institutions uh, decided that they would get together. Perhaps they were going to go to the city uh, and have them give, at least give them the land. Uh, there, there had been some talk about um, a public investment in, in, in a major library edifice, you know, which, which kind of makes sense. Uh, and the other thing to remember is that the early 1830s, before Jackson's you know, death knell uh, on Philadelphia finances, uh, you know, the economy here was running on all, all, all 12 cylinders, you know, and you, you had the, you know, in the early 1830s, you had the Merchants Exchange and Girard College and Preston Retreat uh, and these, these very, uh, very expensive structures going up uh, at the time uh, and, and grand ideas. And, and like I said, when, when money goes south, uh, the, the build, big building plans always get put on the back burner. And the so apprentice any architect a big party idea about the apprentices, the apprentices library they had been located in the free quaker meeting house uh, at fifth and arch street uh, but i don't know the the uh, i don't know exactly what became of them whether they merged with the free library or not okay i'll find that out though and i'll let you know that'd be great thanks just curious so bruce there was a question if you could um there was a portrait of, of william strickland that was shown on the screen if you could pull that back up there's an interest in seeing that and then there's also a question from Steve Heitzman, if we know if all those quote merchants who became early members were active users and readers or mainly supporters and multi joiners. My guess is that they would have been multi joiners. Uh, Steve, you can borrow um, Jill Meisner's thesis uh, and take a look at that. Uh, and uh, she indicates exactly of all 139 members she indicates all of the other uh, institutions that they were uh, that they were member members of she indicates what their religion was uh, sometimes it's assumed by where they were buried uh, or uh, through obituaries uh, and um, uh, so we, we could figure that out uh, and uh, or you, or you can figure it out uh, so let's uh, let's look at you were looking for the Strickland image thank you Bruce Great, sure, great presentation. You're welcome, Steve. And so, one thing we could guess with our, we had such a broad selection so, of, of local, national, international journals, periodicals that it, it's likely people wanted to keep up, merchants wanted to keep up with the news, not only in Philadelphia, but around the country and around the world. They would have wanted to come to the Athenaeum to get that access. By, by the time the, the, the building on Washington Square opened, we subscribed to 90, 90 newspapers uh, and uh, from, from uh, all up and down the Eastern Seaboard, as well as a number of uh, European capitals. And the fact that we were open so darn long, uh, I, I was, uh, was loath to, uh, loath to bring that up because uh, I, I don't want, uh, I'm not sure that I want our membership to say, oh yes, let's, let's stay open now from seven in the morning till 10 at night. Uh, and, and remember all the time that that was being done, it was just old Mr. McElhenney. <laughs> Uh, and speaking of old, um, the members uh, who, uh, who uh, joined uh, in, in 1814, of those 139, about 75% of them were under the age of 40. Uh, so this was a young man's organization. Uh, and uh, it, was born, uh, it was born at a time that, uh, like in the, in the spirit of Franklin, uh, people saw a need uh, and they 
formed an organization to solve that need. Uh, and, uh, and that didn't mean that they were no longer supported the other organizations. Uh, and that, that was certainly true of folks like, uh, uh, folks like Biddle uh, and, and Walks, uh, who uh, had their fingers in a lot of, a lot of different pies. So Susan asked a great question, which Adam uh, Levine was able to answer part of it. But this 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 is a, an interest, and we, there were so many libraries, private libraries, that did not all survive. And what happened to their holdings? As Adam notes, the Franklin Institute auctioned off much of their library in the mid to late 1980s, and of course, the Athenaeum gave parts have, has given parts of its holdings to HSP. Bruce, what else do you know, or can you say about? Uh, and we'll make this our last question. The fate of library holdings as institutions changed or perished. Uh, <laughs> um, it's that's a, a sensitive a, a sensitive question. Um, uh, you know, a lot of it a, a lot of it had to do with economics uh, and, and and with uh, with either um, inability uh, for institutions to survive um, uh, economically. Um, uh, or, or being made superfluous by the free library or other, other organizations. Um, and uh, so the Athenaeum uh, is, is a rare survivor uh, in that it managed to keep itself alive until the, 19, uh, uh, until the 1950s and 60s when some, some new life was, uh, 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 was added to it. Um, the, that will uh, hopefully be the third, uh, third lunchtime talk that uh, I give. Um, Nick, uh, um, Popkin, Nathaniel Popkin, uh, in his book, uh, Hidden Philadelphia, um, uh, used a wonderful phrase. He didn't coin it, but uh, uh, he used it, and it certainly applies. Uh, he, he called the the long 19th century, uh, and that uh, in Philadelphia, the 19th century lasted from, from 1800 to 1970. Uh, and <laughs> and that, uh, that meant a lot of different things uh, in terms of uh, social and cultural organizations, and even industries. Uh, you know, in, in in other places, the industrial revolution uh, petered out uh, or was smashed out uh, fairly early on. Here, it bled to death. Uh, that happened uh, also uh, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, um, cultural organizations, uh, and uh, the Athenaeum is a rare survivor. Uh, and uh, I will talk about that more uh, carefully uh, in a future lecture. Thank you, Adam. Great questions. And thank you to Tim Haas for including a link in the chat um, to a, a book available on Google as an ebook, The History of the Apprentices Library of Philadelphia, 1820 to 1920. Right. For those of you who want to learn more about that, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, we're so pleased all of you came. As, as Bruce notes, we have upcoming lectures and more going on tonight at 6 o'clock. It's not too late to register um, for our program with Lindsay Travinsky about uh, George Washington and the creation of the executive cabinet. Um, as we know, uh, over, over the years, as we watch presidents and how they work with their cabinets, it's a very fascinating story of how Washington set up the precedent for what a president's cabinet might look like and how it functioned. And then tomorrow night, we have Carl Rawlingson um, talking about his two volume biography of William Faulkner. And our next noontime event, Tess, is, can you remind us what that is? Sorry, I put her on the spot. <laughs> uh, the next one is Thomas Carstairs. Bruce can talk more about that, actually. <laughs> oh, OK. Uh, yeah, let me, uh, let me get back to. Um, uh, yes, next month, uh, we're, we're going to ac actually have a conversation, uh, a three-way discussion uh, between uh, Denise Fox, who is our collections care manager, uh, and um, uh, and myself and uh, Steve Arizadi, uh, a painting conservator. And uh, about two years ago, uh, out of the blue, we were given a portrait of Thomas Carstairs, who was the master builder slash, um, uh, slash architect uh, who uh, designed Carstairs Row, uh, now known as Jewelers Row. Uh, and, um, uh, and so we're going to be talking about how the painting came here, uh, Carstairs' uh, role in, uh, in uh, Philadelphia architectural history, uh, and in the actual conservation technique. So it'll be a sort of a, uh, again, there's a trinity of, uh, <laughs> of things occurring. And that will be Tuesday, November 10th at noon. And Tess is including all the links for all of these events uh, right in the chat if you want to 
click on those and get them up in your screen. So once we close, you'll have those on your email so you can, you can register. We are so delighted that all of you showed up. We love all of our Athenaeum friends and